It's a joy to be with you. How many of you have not been here yet? This is your first meeting this morning, and you're willing to repent and get right with God. I don't know where you've been, but we welcome you all, and we're looking forward to a wonderful day. We want to start out with by telling you that prophecy that doesn't do anything to us or challenge us or tell us what to do is a mistake. We're not just here to give you some titillating information about the future. We're here to change lives. Prophecy refers to the entire Bible. We're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 1 if you want to turn there. In 2 Peter chapter 3, which we're not looking at, Peter refers to 2 Peter as his second epistle in which he was trying to bring things to our remembrance because in the last days there'll be those who mock and say, where's the promise of his coming? Now we're referring to uh, stirring our fertile minds up, he said, and remembering what the Lord and the apostles have taught us as to what we should be like in these last days. So I think this becomes a very critical passage. And uh, I'm going to read 25 verses and tell you how we should live in the last days, specifically uh, from God's Word. So we're in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, and uh, we're going to start at verse 13. We'll be reading down to chapter 2 and verse 12. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect to persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever." For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If uh, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, also it's contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. 
But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. And all God's people said, let's look to the Lord in a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you for this passage in which you outlined to us, through the Apostle Peter, exactly what we should be like in the last days. Teach us, Lord, how to live in these crucial times. We realize that today we are one day closer to the return of our blessed Lord Yeshua. And God, I pray that you will deepen us by your Holy Spirit and your word in terms of our lifestyle and conduct and uh, what we say and think and do in these days. We thank you in the precious name of our Lord Yeshua. Amen. Now, how does one live in the last days? And what do you have here in the context which does roll straight through uh, from chapter 1 to chapter 2? There's no chapter break in the original text. But it goes all the way to chapter 2, verse 12. That's why we read all those 25 verses. And in that, if you're following it, there are five applications or illustrations as to how you and I should live in the last days. Uh, you probably noted them as we were reading it. Uh, number one is in chapter 1, verse 14. They are similes. A simile is an abbreviated parable. Uh, there's a likeness there. It doesn't mean it's the same as, but it means there's something about it that we need to know and apply in our lives. First, as obedient children. That's what God says. Uh, I suppose some of us see the simplistic a aspect of it. But that isn't quite the point. As a matter of fact, he breaks this down for us and starts by looking at our lifestyle. He says, be ye holy. If we are obedient children of the Lord, we belong to the Lord, we've been born again by the Spirit of God, then we are to obey God's Word. Ask the question, how do you clean up your act if you got some real trouble? The Bible says that we are to give attention to the Word of God, that it will clean us up. Psalm 119, verse 8, How can a young man cleanse his way? Answer, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Be ye holy, what? In all manner of conversation. Now there are some uh, linguistic guys who are telling us that the old English conversation should remain there. Most modern English translates it conduct. But the point of the word, though it does refer to conduct and lifestyle, is that what you say, what comes out of your mouth, how you talk, reflects usually how you really live. So the old King James may have a better word, conversation. Let your conversation be holy. And uh, there's a lot of things said here that are very, very critical. I'm going to give you four areas in which, according to this text, we are to be holy in our lifestyle. Let's first of all straighten out the word holy in our minds. Does holy mean separation? Yes, it does. Uh, well, then we are separate from sin. Uh, yes, we are. Through the work of our blessed Lord, we are holy, therefore, in our position. We are separated from the consequences of sin, death, and hell. 
We are separated from the penalty of sin, that's for sure. But we are also separated, according to the argument of Romans, from the power of sin to control our life. We don't have to live defeated lives. And the good news is that we are going to be holy completely one day as we will be separated from the very presence of sin. Everybody okay on that? But the root behind the word holiness is not just separate from sin, which God is indeed, but it's separate from the material and physical creation which he himself created. Holiness means that God is never to be identified with the physical and material creation. That's why we don't hug trees and talk to plants. Hello? And we don't save whales and kill babies. We got this all turned around because we forgot the holiness of God. So the holiness begins uh, from the standpoint of the Word of God, the need of chastening. Turn to Hebrews, uh, just a few pages before 1 Peter, chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, and pick it up at verse 6. Hebrews 12, verse 6. For the Lord loveth whom he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That's a strong word. If you endure chastening, the inference is a lot of us can't hang in there when it comes. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, as obedient children, with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. In other words, illegitimate children. Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his What does it say, folks? Holiness. Be ye holy, for I am holy. How do we live in the last days? As obedient children. What does that mean? It means in our lifestyle, we understand the importance of holiness. Wow. Well, in order for that to be a productive matter in our life, that we really would be holy, and we really would be obedient children, we need chastening. Now, our Lord is so loving, he gives you a long rope. But every now and then he tightens it and said, that's enough. God is going to bring that chastening into our life. Now, we read verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous or painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and what? Holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Wow, that's pretty strong, isn't it? Let's go back to 1 Peter again. We need chastening. But there's a second thing, and that is that we need contentment. If you're still in Hebrews, look at chapter 13, verse 5. In our effort to be holy as God is holy, we need chastening in our lifestyle. God has to stop us by turn of events that we may not like, but God's going to use it to put us back on the right track again. Now, we also need contentment. Hebrews 13, 5 says... Let your conversation, that's the same subject as 1 Peter 1, conversation, conduct, lifestyle, what you say reveals what you are. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Sometimes when you listen to a person, all they're saying and all they're doing is getting more stuff. Jesus said, your life does not consist of the abundance of the things that you possess. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain because we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we're not going to take anything out. 
A pastor friend of mine just had his home burned down. He gave me a call to tell me about it because it was in the paper. It was an old restored home, and uh, he had spent a lot of time uh, fixing it up, getting antique furniture, all that stuff, and uh, it was a spot people like to drive by. And something went wrong with the wiring in that old home, and uh, the place burned down while they were gone. Praise the Lord, none of them or their children or grandchildren were killed. But he called, and I said, well, I'm really sorry about that. He said, oh, it's such a blessing. You know, I've been on the wrong track for a long time. You have? He said, yeah, that, that home was an idol in my life. I mean, I worked on it all the time, bought all this stuff. Every, I spent good money, should have given to the Lord's work. He said, God took care of the problem. <laughs> Burned it to the ground. Well, God bless him for his attitude, but he did have contentment in the Lord. And we need it desperately. Now, there's a third thing we need if we're going to be holy in our lifestyle as obedient children. And that's it, the fact that we need control. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And here's what we read. The opening three verses and then two a little later in the chapter. 1 Thessalonians 4. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For we know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. That's the word holiness, same word in 1 Peter 1. What is your holiness? That you abstain from fornication. Fornication is the word porneia, from which we get pornography. A lot of people believe that's sex before marriage. That is absolutely false. The Greek word porneia is also used of adultery, homosexuality, all kinds of sexual diseases and practices that are mentioned in God's law. It's all porneia. In other words, the true definition of porneia is the wrong use of sexual desire. Well, what's the right use? Well, it's not same-sex marriage. I can tell you that right now. It's the marriage that is honorable in all, says Hebrews 13, 4. And the bed, or the coitus, is undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Porneia. What an interesting argument. Here we are in the last days. We want to learn how to live as we see these prophetic events happening. And God says, well, I'll tell you how to live. Live like an obedient child, which means you need to be holy. You need to be separate. And that involves chasing. I've got to bring it into your life to make you what I need you to be in the last days. Secondly, you need contentment because a lot of things in this world won't turn out the way you thought. And third, you need control because if you are bent towards marriage, you are bent towards sexual desire. The Bible teaches it. So a lot of us want to say, hey, you know, it's no problem in my life. As a man who was younger than I am at this time, when I was a young pastor, he told me it's no problem. When you get older, you'll know what I'm talking about. Well, he left his wife and went for a younger woman, and he was lying through his teeth. Now that I'm an old guy, I know how many old saints were lying through their teeth. Amen? People say, well, you know, I had sexual desire when I was a kid, but I don't have much now. Look, you may do it slower, but you still got it. You know, the fact is we don't pay attention to God. When my wife and I wrote the book, uh, Romantic Lovers, which, by the way, is still the best-selling marriage book of all time, to God be the glory, because it's an exposition of Song of Solomon, the most erotic literature you could ever read. God knows all about sex. Playboy didn't invent it. God did. And we need to pay attention to it. One of the common letters we got from all around the world, it's now in 16 languages, the common letter we got was, thank God somebody put the beauty of romance and sex back into marriage. Why? Because we've gotten so far away, we're listening to the gutter talk instead of God talk. We need to get back to the Word of God. If we're going to be obedient children and be holy, which God wants us to be in this generation as we're facing the return of our Lord, more than ever, we need control. And that's what God teaches us. Look down at verse 7 and 8. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto what? What does it say? 
holiness. That's the calling of God. He wants us to be separate from the world and all of its standards of morality. We need to be separate. Stop listening and, 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 and viewing that junk. Get it out of your life. It's all over the internet. It's on primetime television. Get it out of your life. You don't need it. You need to walk with the Lord. So important, verse 8. He therefore that despises, or put this down, despises not man, but God. Listen, if you are continuing it, and you're looking down on those Christians who have righteous standards, just let me uh, uh, review to your mind that the issue is your relationship to God. You are despising God. You are living dangerously. And he says, he who despises, it's not man, it's God, who hath given unto us what kind of a spirit? Ah, Holy Spirit. The third person of the triune God is not called holy for no reason at all. And his presence and work in our life is to produce holiness. If you want another great verse to add to this in your notes, Galatians 5, 16. Walk in the Spirit. The Greek can read by means of the Spirit. I don't want to argue over that. Walk in the Spirit. Why? that you don't carry out the lust of the flesh. God never says you don't have the lust of the flesh. That's going to continue until you drop dead and go home to be with the Lord. Amen? So I guess the only way to get out of some of your problems is to drop dead. No, we, we need to learn about the control of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit by means of the Spirit, and you will not carry out the lust of the flesh. That's what God said. So how are we to live in the last days? As obedient children. We need uh, ch uh, chastising, and we need contentment, and we need control. And there's a fourth thing, we need change. Oh, do we need change. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Sometimes we say of somebody, well, he's just like he's always been. I hope they don't say that of you. I hope instead they will say something like, you know, I can't believe the change that has come over that guy. He doesn't listen to what he used to. He doesn't do what he used to. He is totally different now. May God be praised. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness, callousness literally, of thy, their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. I asked a bunch of junior high kids about what they thought lasciviousness means. One little boy raised his hand. He said, I don't know, but it sure sounds bad. <laughs> Aselgea is referring to a city in Pisidian Antioch named Selge. It was a stoic city. They had curfews and rules, and you couldn't do a lot. When you put the negative a ah in front of it, a ah selgea is referring to no standards of morality, which is exactly where everybody heads without the Lord. So here we go. Who being past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanness and greediness. Look at this next verse. But you have not so learned Christ. If so be that you've heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conversation. There's that word again from 1 Peter, our text. You put off the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you may put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true what? What does it say? Holiness. Well, we, we've had a lot on that, so let's go back to 1 Peter 1. So we have said so far, how do we live in the last days? How do we live? We are told, uh, back, 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 back. As newborn babes is number two, but we aren't ready for it. Uh, does anybody know how to get this thing back 
as it once was. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Will you get me back? This is the Lord's will for your life. God is going to bless you for your kindness to this very troubled speaker. No, keep going. No, back the other way. Back the other way. Back, 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 back. God bless you. Let's give him a hand. Praise the Lord. Amen. And thank you on the web for being so patient with us. Well, us. What a, what a phony answer that was. Patient with me. Amen. All right. So he said, as obedient children. What, you, you blew it? That's what I wanted up there. Oh, it's not up there. Oh, what did you do? I love to blame somebody else beside me. Is it up there now? We're okay. How to live in the last days as obedient children. Amen. You want to just stay here and be with me during the message? <laughs> okay. So the first thing we learn is our lifestyle. And what do we hear God say? Be ye holy. Be separate. And of course, there's going to be a need of chastening. God said so. So that we would be partakers of his holiness and a need of contentment. Oh, how we need that. Stop getting all this stuff that you don't need anyway. Amen? Uh, yesterday, I had a blue and striped dress shirt on. Somebody asked me, well, where did you get that? And I said, uh, well, let's see. About the only place you can would be casual mail. They said, you got it at casual mail? I said, well, let me just put this real clear to you. Real men start at 4X and go up. You have to go to the big and tall shop. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they said, well, how many of those shirts you have? I said, I have no idea. There's some in my closet. And, uh, well, are they really expensive? I said, I have no idea. I don't pay much for my shirts. I just uh, bring it up in my messages and folks feel sorry and buy me another shirt. <laughs> you know, that's how I work through life. <laughs> He said, well, I knew something was funny. Your shirt looks good, but that suit. He said, how long you had that? <laughs> uh, that's pre-war days. Okay, here we go. We need control. We got to have control. That's what God said. When people are out of control and call themselves believers, the impact is lost upon a generation that desperately needs it. And we need change. You didn't learn Christ in all this unholy walk and talk. No, it was totally different. We need to be renewed in our minds. Put off the former conversation, all its deceitful lusts. Put on a new man. Learn from God's Word. Renew your mind daily in the Word of God. Amen? But there's a second thing about this as obedient children. The longest section, by the way, for those of you who are worried if we're going to finish on time, is the first one. It's a long one. And it goes from verse 13 all the way down to verse 25. And it ends with your love for one another. Imagine that. God wants you and me to be obedient children, which means we're to love one another. And a lot of people say, hey, I love the brothers. Amen. God bless you. No, he doesn't want passive indifference. His words are for boiling passion fervently. We're not calloused and indifferent to one another. We become now members of the same family. Well, brother, blood's thicker than water. That's not in the Bible. Unless you're talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. You understand, when we get saved, we have a new family relationship. You may not want them, but they're in the family. And we've got to learn to live with each other. So God says, love one another. And notice he flipped back to the previous context by saying, with a pure heart. And do it fervently. Number two. In chapter two of First Peter, we have our next simile. Look at verse two. The first one was in verse 14, as obedient children. Next one, as newborn babes. You say, well, I'm not a newborn babe. I've known the Lord for 30 years. It's a simile. There's something about a newborn babe that should characterize every believer in the last days. 
Well, what in the world is he talking about in these opening three verses? Well, the first thing I'd bring to your attention are the practices that will stunt your spiritual growth. Practices that stunt your growth? Absolutely. Here they are, three of them. Malice. That's going to stunt your growth. People say, well, what is that? Well, actually, it's all kinds of meanness. That's, uh, another translation is it's good for nothingness. All you're doing is spouting off. You know, when people don't do what we want, we find ways to deal with that. One of them is to put them down. Another one is to put us up. Well, you know, I'm much more important than you. Somebody says, well, I, I don't agree with you doctrinally. Well, as soon as you get three doctorates, come and talk to me again. I mean, how stupid can we be? Some of the most unintelligent people have gotten educated beyond their intelligence. Amen? The only ones that didn't say amen are those who have a doctor's degree. <laughs> Do you understand? This is ridiculous what has happened. And I see it in the body of Christ all the time. Some leader in the church said, well, when you've been around this church as long as I have, you'll know uh, that I'm right and you're wrong. Malice. Why are you so mean? Why don't you listen to the brother, even if you're not going to do what he says, but show respect to all people, no matter who they are, if it's a brand new convert. I find some of them say the most positive things that are really wonderful. But after a few years, you get to where you're kind of grumpy and mean and ugly. God help us. My uh, youngest son and his wife called me one day and uh, said, uh, what are you doing? I said, I'm in bed with your mother. It's 9 o'clock at night. 9 o'clock? It's time to go out. We want you to go out with us. I said, hey, I'm tired. Don't you have any friends? <laughs> he said, yeah, but you're a lot more fun. <laughs> Okay, but you know, I thank God for that. Why, why don't we have more humor in our home? Look in the mirror, it should crack you up right away. <laughs> Come on, stop being so stodgy and old and ugly. People told me that, well, when you get older, you can be, no, you can't, you can be funnier than ever. Look at a lot of old people, they're really funny, what they say, what they do. Those with Alzheimer's, I love it. You meet new people in your home every day. <laughs> it's great, folks. Stop all this nonsense. I don't care what age they are. Be very careful about malice because it's gripping the body of Christ all over the place. But guile, hey. There are two kinds of guile in the Bible. One is hypocrisy. Would you notice, please, right there, all guile and hypocrisies and envies. Those are the two kinds of guile. Hypocrisy is simply putting on an act, acting like you're something you're not. And envyings, oh, let's just put it real simple so all of us understand. You're upset over the blessing of others. You get all upset because somebody is being blessed. God says in the body of Christ, we care so much for one another that when one of, uh, one of us gets honored or rewarded by society or life, we all rejoice with them. And if they go through a hard, painful time, we weep with them. We need to love one another. That command is 16 times in the New Testament. If you take the word one another, alelon in Greek, it's used 100 times, makes a wonderful Bible study. What is the one another relationship of believers? All described by loving one another. We got all kinds of things. Comfort one another, encourage one another, pray for one another. You know, it goes on and on and on. Let's stop being so upset with each other. We are not the same. I don't like churches who try to make everybody the same. It's ridiculous. Take music, for instance. Take it. People argue over that. It just drives me up the wall. I'd love to take them to third world countries or the jungles of Africa where they sing 30 stanzas of a song without proper instrumentation. No, they just beat tin cans and sing at the top of their voices. And I love it. Besides, everyone knows the only 
two kinds of music God blesses is country and western, of course. Come on, give it up, will you? Lady came up to me and says, I walked by the youth department and I heard some almost like jungle music. I said, well, I go frequently to the jungles and it's pretty good out there. She said, this is awful. You know, it's a rock. Well, I believe in a solid rock. God is a rock. No, it's, it, it's, it's that beat. I said, every song has a beat. Depends on where you put it. She says, are you sure I should be talking to you? <laughs> and evil speakings, <laughs> you know what that is? Just put one word down in your notes. That's slander. Evil speakings is, is constantly speaking against others that runs them down. <laughs> Lady came up to me and she said, I'm not coming here another Sunday until you straighten your life out. I said, what have I done now? She said, lift up your hands. And I did like this. She said, higher. I went higher. Now at that time, I was in Southern California. I had a lot of short sleeve shirts. And my coat, of course, went down my arm. She said, Look at those nude arms. That is a disgrace and a shame before God. I didn't have the courage to tell her. I usually wear Hawaiian shirts when I speak. But anyway, uh, I said, oh, well, I'm sorry, but uh, I don't have any long sleeve shirt. The next day in my office, four long sleeve shirts arrived. All white, of course. The biblical standard of true pastoral ministry. A song comes to mind every time I put on a tie, which I've done in honor of you, Pastor Glenn. You're so good looking. So I put on a tie, and a song comes to mind, blessed be the tie that binds. <laughs> That's why women live longer than men. We're slowly choking to death by wearing these ties. Look, stop all the malice and guile and evil speakings. There ought to be one place where we all have a great time in the Lord, we can rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, when we come together to worship and praise the Lord. Amen? Please. The prerequisite for growth is stated and makes us understand why God wants us to be newborn babes. He said, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So what's the picture here? It's of a nursing child on the breast of its mother. What he's talking about is our hunger and desire for the Word of God. So many people use this verse for new convert study. Uh-uh. That isn't the point. All believers in the last days should be characterized as a newborn babe that's on the breast of its mother. Now, I've seen this three times in my life. The first time, I was about ready to kill a kid. I thought he was going to destroy the breast of my wife. When he got hungry, let me tell you, he was hungry. It didn't matter what you did. He wanted that breast. He went after it. And I've never forgotten it because God said, that's what I want you to be towards the Word of God. And some of us have got so calloused, indifferent, apathetic to the Word of God. Are you kidding me? God wants the believers in the last days to go after that Word, to hunger like a little nursing baby on the breast of its mother. May God help us to understand. Number three. If you're following this, the third illustration, these are going faster now. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also, here it comes, as lively or living stones. Now what in the world is he trying to tell us here? He is looking at the whole body of Christ as a building. Build on the foundation. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, Other foundation can no man lay but that which is laid in Jesus Christ. He is the chief cornerstone. The great argument of Psalm 118, the Hallel, that's sung by all the Levitical priests, the musicians, and the instrumentalists at Passover season. The stone which the builders rejected. This is the day that the Lord hath made, will rejoice and be glad in it. Sometimes we sing that song as though it refers to today. No, it doesn't. It refers back to the day Jesus died. The builders of Judaism 
rejected the chief cornerstone. But God said, I lay in Zion a cornerstone. And that is the rock of offense and the stone of stumbling. People stumble over what? The identity of the Messiah. If I ask people, do you have to believe in the Messiah in order to go to heaven? They look at me like they had a strange question just given to them. Listen, you must believe he's the Messiah of Israel. You say, where's that? John 20, 30 and 31. Many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Yeshua is Hamashiach, is the Messiah, the Son of God. In believing that, you will have life through his name. Yes, you must believe that he is the Messiah. There is no other hope. The Messiah himself said in Isaiah 45, Look unto me, all you ends of the earth, and be ye saved. For I am God, and there is none else. We need to come to the Messiah who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Amen? Well, he's the cornerstone upon which the whole superstructure is being built. Well, what are we? We are living stones. What for? First, it deals with the purpose of your life and mine. What is the purpose of my life? And here's what I read. Verse 5. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable or well-pleasing to God by Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 13, 15 to 16 tells us to offer the spiritual sacrifice of thanksgiving, the fruit of our lips. I love to be around people who keep thanking God for everything. I was coming back from a meeting in Fresno, California, up at Hume Lake Christian Camp, up in the Sequoias. And I decided to not wait till Monday morning, even though it was a long trip home. I was going to, I was feeling so great. I got into my little Volkswagen, the older kind. They had a higher roof. I got in that little Volkswagen, decided to head home. Man, I was singing the praises of the Lord. I couldn't believe how spiritual I was. After a wonderful weekend, I got past Bakersfield and started going up the grapevine, and I had a flat tire. I'm telling you, I was so impressed with myself the way I handled it. I got out of that car and said, God, I want to praise your name for this opportunity. Undoubtedly, somebody's going to stop by to help me, and I'll have the joy of leading them to Jesus Christ. I stood by my car and waited. There wasn't a single car going up that grapevine. I said, it's all right, Lord. It's your purposes. I got the jack out. I fixed the tire. I got back in the car singing the praises of the Lord. Man, I said, it's wonderful to be spirit-filled, isn't it? So I got going about a half hour up the road of that grapevine. I had another flat. All my spirituality went out of the window. I said, thanks a lot. What do you think's in the back? It's a flat tire. What am I going to do now? I got out, I slammed the door and bent it. That made me mad, so I kicked the flat tire. Of course, I kicked the hubcap and smashed it. I couldn't believe it. I waited around, waited around. At 3 in the morning, a truck driver came through and said, having a problem? Shut up! <laughs> you know, I didn't know what to say. I was totally out of control. He said, hey, we'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. He got me up to Gorman, and I got the tire fixed. I went home. I was so grumpy. I came in. My wife woke up early in the morning, and she said, Did you have a wonderful conference? No! You know, it's amazing how a little thing can turn your heart away from what God designed you to do. You lost your job. You can't get any credit anymore. Your mortgage, you can't pay it. Praise God. He's got something wonderful for you. Offer the sacrifices of thanksgiving unto the Lord. That's the purpose of our life. And number two, the person who makes it all possible, it says, he is precious. <laughs> I love that. Every unbeliever stumbles over him, but as a believer, Christ is all. He is everything in all, in every circumstance of life. In him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It is God's will that I grow in grace and in the knowledge of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Do we get it? Number four, as chosen people. As chosen people. A royal nation, a holy priesthood, chosen. Wow. What wonderful things. The point is, you are designed by God to praise him. You have a new relationship to God and relationship to everyone around you. And that's what verse 9 says. We can praise the Lord, show his marvelous works, show what it is to come out of darkness into light. And it's not only designed to praise him, it's, we're declared to be the people of God. How? By his mercy. If I got what I deserved, if you got what you deserved, we'd be in hell. Doesn't it disgust you, the pride that goes on in churches? We think we're something special. We're only special because of what God did in our life. We're still sinners saved by grace. And when you learn if somebody is a drunk and in the gutters of your city and your town, my friends, what you ought to say in your heart is, there go I but the grace of God, and I'm going to do all I can to help that guy. Many, many times back in the hippie movement, of course, we all know the wonderful story of Pastor Chuck Smith and what he did to the hippies in the Jesus People movement. I was pastoring in Long Beach at the time. We had the same problem. Tons of them came in. And uh, people of the church uh, were really upset. These are weird people. Long-haired, stinking, smelling, didn't wear shoes. What do you do? Hey, you love them, bring them in. Let them enjoy what God has said in his word. I'm preaching on the platform of a free speech platform back in the, oh, I miss those days. <laughs> After Vietnam, it was crazy on the campuses. But they had what they call free speech platforms, and you could sit there and speak. You start speaking about God, you'd have a 1,000 people in no time at lunch hour. And they threw rotten tomatoes and eggs at you and everything and swore. Today, they're all into money. They don't care. They just stare at you. Oh, hi. Back then, they were really standing for something. They just can't remember what it was they were for. Now they're the president of our country. Oh, yeah. The mentor of our president all during his junior high, high school years in Hawaii is a pastor in Calvary Chapel. He handled that kid when no one else wanted him. And he tells me all the time, <laughs> I put all that time into him, and now it looks like he's forsaken everything I taught him. But he said, I still love him, and I pray for him. And what do we hear? Oh, we hear a lot of bashing go on about Obama. There's hardly anything he's done in these first hundred days that I don't agree, disagree with. I mean, I don't agree with. I just disagree with everything. It's just unbelievable. I went on whitehouse.gov slash forward slash agenda and that was up five minutes after he uh, had his inaugural. And I read it. I couldn't believe it. This is the agenda of our president. He's going to change this country away from the word of God and from the moral standards that are in the Bible. Hey, don't take my word for it. Read it for yourself. But I tell you, I still am telling people, let's pray earnestly for our president, our vice president. And this one hurts. Secretary of State, pray for her too. Amen. That's what Paul told us to do in 1 Timothy chapter 2. You know, folks, we got to wake up. Stop bashing these people. Instead, pray for these people. We can preach against what's wrong, but let's don't attack the people. The Bible tells us to show respect and honor for those in authority. We need to be examples. We are declared to be the people of God. How? By His mercy, holding back from us what we really deserve, which is hell itself. And if that gets into your heart, you'll begin to be used of the Lord. The pride and arrogance and all of that will go out the window. There's no room for it. If any man boasts, he will boast in the Lord, not in himself. Let another man praise you, not the words of your own mouth. It's amazing what we learn. But there's one last simile here in verses 11 and 12. As strangers and pilgrims. Now what is God 
saying to us here. In the last days, as we're facing the return, or as he said earlier, the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, what do we do as believers in the midst of this chaotic world? What do we do? We remember that we're strangers and pilgrims. You say, what's that talking about? Well, to put it very simply, the world is not our home. Hello? Did you think this is your place? Well, I have a nice home in Fargo, North Dakota. What? Paul said in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior. The word citizenship is our Greek word, is a Greek word translated into English, politics. My politics is in heaven, and I'm looking for the return of Jesus Christ. My friends, the world is not our home. Are they controlling your life? Forget it. Don't you love that old song? This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Paul said that. He was a tent maker. He's going to pull up stakes one day. He said to be with Christ is far better for me to live as Christ and to die as gain because I'll be with him forever. Do we really understand? Secondly, the war is within you. That's what he said. The war is within you. The end of verse 11. You see, fleshly lusts war against your own soul. So many believers are in turmoil. Why? Because there's something wrong in the heart. We need to repent and get right with the Lord. Get the junk out of your life. If you're a believer who knows what God said as to how he wants you to live in the last days, Stop laughing when the dirty, filthy jokes are told down at work. Get that junk, and by all means, don't let it cross your lips at all. We need to clean up our lifestyle, people. We're going down the tubes while the world desperately needs to see somebody who will live for the Lord in these times. And one last thing. Your works will cause others to glorify God. It may be a cup of cold water given in his name. Our Lord said, let your light so shine before men that they may glorify who? Your Father, not you, who is in heaven. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. My friends, I want people to glorify God by what I do and what I say. You've got to be the same in private as you are in the pulpit. I tell preachers that all the time. Stop putting on. One guy said, well, you're loud. I said, you should hear me in private. You understand? Yes, I'm loud, and sometimes it's a bigger auditorium, so I get louder. And sometimes I look out there and I see people sacking during my message. I'm going to get louder. I'm going to scare the daylights out of them. I'm going to wake them up for Jesus' sake. I had a guy snoring in the front row, bothering everybody. Oh, it was so terrible. You know what I did? I know I shouldn't. I called on him to pray. <laughs> Woke him up and said, would you pray, please? And, oh, yes. He stood right up and prayed right during my message. I said, thank you very much. You may be seated. I know it's crazy. But you understand? We've got to be the same, people. The world needs to see that somebody's real among these believers. Do we got problems? We got lots of problems. Are we everything we should be? No. But we will one day. We will one day. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. We can all be thankful for that. We do not appear what we shall be, but we know when he appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Amen? Will you join me in prayer? Thank you for your patience. Father, how we praise you for your word. The word, according to our text, that lives and abides forever. The word which is by the gospel preached unto us. How we thank you for the good news that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day was seen of so many people, ascended into heaven and promised, he said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, 
that where I am, there ye may be also. Father, help us to understand. You gave us instruction about how to live. God, may we pay more attention than we ever have before in our life. And I pray for those in our midst that are deeply troubled. Something's wrong and they know it. It's not just the spiritual blahs and indifference of life, but there's a real violation of what you teach in your word. And things get worse because we won't repent. Lord, I pray that you would cause us right now to turn to you. Just cry out like a little child. Say, God, please help me. With your head bowed and eyes closed, please don't look around. Maintain privacy for everybody. Show respect. I'm not going to call on your name or embarrass you, but I want you to turn to the Lord right now. And just to seal it in your heart. I think it's a good idea. Just raise your hand at the same time. Say, Lord, please help me. Please. Yes. Yes. Right where you are. Yes. Yes. God bless you. Wonderful. A couple together. God bless your heart. God bless you. Yes, all over. Listen, God loves you. Yes, way in the back. When your hand's up there, pray. Talk to him, just like you would anybody else. Say, God, please. Yes, God bless you. Yes, yes. There isn't a more important day than right now. It's the only day we can live. And we need to get right with the Lord. The world has yet to see what would happen to a body of people who say they love Jesus and all of a sudden act like it. The impact would be enormous. Father, you saw these hands, but more importantly, you see our hearts. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God, please help us to get to a Bible as soon as we can and find out what it is that we're to believe and know and do. How we praise you, Lord, for your patience with us, your long-suffering, your mercy, your grace, and your wonderful forgiveness. In the blessed name of our Lord Yeshua, we pray. Amen. If you'd like some help from us, out in the book and tape table, there's a little white decision card. We'll send you free a booklet that I've written to help you understand what God wants, and also a free Bible study by mail. One lady already asked me, she said, well, does it, does it give me the answers? No, the Bible gives you answers. We only ask the question and give you the verse. Well, you mean I got to come up with it? Absolutely. We want you to study the Bible. Then you send it back, we help you with it, and we'll send you the next one. There's several. It's a great way to get started and to settle your heart down as to what your real relationship is with Jesus Christ our Lord. God bless you.